This is Ian P. Reports, a vodcast from Editor and Publisher Magazine, the authoritative voice of news media since 1884, serving newspapers, broadcast, digital, and all forms of news publishing. And greetings once again, Mike Blender, publisher, ENP Magazine. As always, we kick off with housekeeping. Listening on a podcast platform of choice, please follow us watching on YouTube. There is a subscribe button below us. There is a bell to the right. Do one and then the other in whatever. I think you have to do subscribe, then bell. You'll get an update each and every time we upload our weekly podcast series, ENP Reports. I am in the presence of greatness. You're a well-known person. Um, I, I think you were actually more more well known when the movie came out right i mean let's be honest when leave schreiber played you he looked just like you do you agree i mean the people uh, yeah well thank you for those nice comments i appreciate it it's great to be with you um uh yeah you know the, uh, you, uh, the power of pop, uh, popular culture is just incredible i mean uh, of course at the boston globe we had worked on that uh, catholic church investigation it, the initial story came out in january of 2002 we published probably 900 plus stories uh, over the next year and a half, but a uh, movie reaches a lot of people and a lot of people were not aware of how that investigation was conducted. So made a big, made a big impact. Well, you know, the Hollywood Reporter actually put your picture next to leave saying who is who. I don't know if you saw that on the internet. Yeah, well, you know, the, the funny thing is, the funny thing is, is that people say he looks, uh, at least in the movie, looks just like me. And, but nobody has ever said that I look like him. So how does that work? I don't know. Marty Barron is our guest today. Um, but I, from there, after in 2012, you went over to the Washington Post. Little did you know, correct me if I'm wrong, a few months later, you were purchased by Jeff Bezos. And uh, you stayed there till recently, uh, 2021. And you had 10 Pulitzer Prizes under your watch there, a few in Boston. My God, sir. I'm honored to have you on the program, but the reason you're here is to discuss your latest book, Collision of Power, from Bezos and the Washington Post. Uh, amazing read. I only got through half of it because you granted me this interview like in 12 hours ago, so I only got through half of it. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to chat about your life at the Globe and, of course, your feelings about the industry on the backside of this message. This episode of e &P Reports is exclusively sponsored by Blocks Digital, formerly Town News. Even though the name has changed, their commitment to the media industry is as strong as ever. Blocks Digital is now even better positioned to deliver integrated solutions like content management, audience development, advertising revenue, video management, and more. Join the over 2,000 news publishers worldwide that power their ongoing digital transformation with Blocks Digital. Serving over 141 million monthly users who view over 6.5 billion pages of content each year. You can trust Blocks Digital to empower you, to connect you, at scale, with the community you need to reach. Blocks Digital, formerly Town News, now reimagined to help meet the news publishing challenges of tomorrow and beyond. Learn more at BlocksDigital.com. Your book starts in a very interesting setting. And I know everybody asks you about this. You had dinner at the White House with Donald and and Jared and Melania was there too. Am I right? Yeah, Melania was there. And then from the Washington Post, it was uh, Jeff Bezos, our publisher, Fred Ryan, uh, our the now late uh, editorial page editor, Fred Hyatt, and myself. This is fascinating so, because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and when we were all watching you take over I mean, Bezos take over. You, he gave you autonomy, correct? I mean, you were you were the editor in chief. He said he was going to stay out of your wheelhouse. What was he doing at that dinner, if I may ask? Why did it upset you? Was it? I hope it's not. It's not a gotcha. Yeah, yeah no. I mean, I, I was concerned about that because uh, he did say at the beginning that he would give us our independence journalistically, and he, right. and in fact, he, he did do that. He never reneged on that. Uh, but uh, our publisher felt that it was a good idea for us to meet with uh, the president. Um, obviously, you know, the preeminent news organization in Washington meeting with a uh, new president. Um, and uh, he, uh, the feeling was that Bezos should be there. At least that was the feeling on his part. But I was very wary of that meeting for a variety of reasons. 
One, that Bezos's presence would signal to Trump that he was involved in the news coverage or could be involved in the news coverage if he wished to be or should be involved. And um, and secondly, that Trump is fundamentally a transactional individual. And if he granted us the favor of having dinner, that he would expect something in return. Um, and, um, and, you know, that's pretty much how it turned out. I think that Trump did interpret that uh, meeting as signaling that Bezos uh, was involved or should be involved. Uh, and Trump leaned on him the very next morning, uh, called him at eight o'clock in the morning on his cell phone uh, and said, uh, I don't know if you get involved in the news coverage, but I'm sure you do uh, to some extent. Um, that was contradictory on his part to say that. But uh, and then uh and he asked Bezos to do something to make sure the coverage was, as Trump put it, more fair to him. Uh, and uh, Bezos responded that uh, he did not get involved in the news coverage and that if he did, uh, he would regret it for the rest of his life. Uh, and at the end of that conversation, uh, Trump said, invited, uh, essentially invited Bezos to ask for a favor. He said, well, if there's anything that I can ever do for you. Uh, and um, thankfully, Bezos never followed up, never did ask for a favor. And um and did continue to give us our independence. Uh, but um, Trump interpreted that meeting in a way that I fully expected. But, but was it true that during the meeting, a phone rang and Jared found out that you were publishing information about uh, Mueller investigating his business dealings? At that very moment during the dinner, it turned in that direction? Uh, yes. Well, uh, his one of his communications people was there. Um, her phone either rang or buzzed um, yeah. and he showed the story. He knew that we were working on this story, of course, uh, but um, she then it was one that uh, didn't reflect favorably on him. That, um, and so um, uh, she showed it to to Jared Kushner and whispered to him, um, very Shakespearean, having dinner with your enemy. Um, and that's what she that's what she had to say. And and Fred Hyatt, who was sitting right near there and heard overheard it, said, we're not your enemy. And um, and that was that was that. But um, in any event, it was it was a uh, it was an awkward dinner. Trump did virtually all of the talking. I bet. Uh, he was talking <laughs> directly to uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, who was on the other side of the dinner table, uh, and he would periodically criticized the post, uh, which he at that time was naming the worst media outlet. Uh, and every time he did criticize the post, he would, I was to his left and he would poke me with his elbow. Um, and I have to tell you, I was very tempted to poke him back, but of course I restrained myself. Hopefully the food was good. I mean, from that, it was, it was good. You know, the white house chefs are pretty good. <laughs> there you go. All right. So when I took over ENP and, and I, I, I come from the business side. I like Mr. Bezos, and I'm nowhere near his whatever, but how did you feel about the fact that he started thinking more of the, the post as a brand? You see, Ron, because that's the first thing I said. It's EMP is a brand. It's 140 years old. What am I going to do with this brand? I think in that business term, you come from the editorial side where you maybe that did that register quickly with you? Did, were you conflicted at the time? Or are you okay with all those discussions? Uh, I wasn't conflicted on that at all. I mean, I, I mean, obviously the brand is why I, you know, was honored okay. to work. Uh, that's why so many people work at the, at the post is because of its history and its heritage mm -hmm. and, and um, it's the work that it does. And that is the brand. Uh, and what was impressive about Bezos uh, when he arrived was that he put so much emphasis on that and how yeah. you could accentuate that. There were a lot of younger people on the staff, particularly the digital types, who uh, almost were kind of running away from that, feeling you needed to start something new. Of course, that was the time when HuffPost was uh, ascendant and when BuzzFeed News was ascendant and a bunch of other digital upstarts were ascendant. Uh, and there was a feeling by many in the industry, uh, in fact, some of the old guard, that that you know we needed to break away from these old sort of old brands. But Bezos felt very strongly that, no, we actually needed to, we needed that brand. That is what he acquired. And that we needed to, and then we needed, but we needed to adapt that brand to the digital era. And so really that was his focus. That's why he worked on the motto, which became Democracy Dies in Darkness. Early on when we were developing, he very much wanted to create a new tablet app. And, you know, some of the younger people, he encouraged people to think, you know, openly about the possibilities. And and um, and some of the younger people were proposing something that didn't even mention the Washington Post. And he outright rejected that, saying, no, that's what I just 
but when you put up that, that that slogan or whatever you want to call it, that slug line, the your branding, democracy dies in darkness. This was around the same time where Trump was calling you the enemy of the, the people, right? I mean, so there must have been some. Uh, yeah, we we introduced it right about then, right after he took right right after he took office. Uh, we had actually been working on it for over two years. Uh, we had about a thousand different options. Most of wow. them, I mean, almost all of them, really bad. Um, <laughs> hard. I mean, it was hard. I mean, he his. Uh, he felt that we should have some, say something and something that offered sort of um, an art was really an articulation of our distinct contribution to to the United States and to democracy. He urged us not to uh, shy away from the democracy word, although he didn't mandate that we use it. Uh, he said he wanted something that would fit on a T-shirt, uh, which was interesting. Uh, but the most important thing that he said is that um he said he wanted it to be a, a not a newspaper to convey that it was not a newspaper that people should subscribe to, but an idea that they wish to belong to. Um, and um, and so that was um, that was his articulation of it. And I think that and very importantly, that emphasizes that newspapers are a product that's different from a lot of other products, but almost all other products. We actually have it, it articulated that we have a relationship with our our consumers, with our readers uh, and that. Um, we want them to sort of buy into that. We want them to buy into our mission. We want them, they're, they're going to subscribe to us because they want to proceed on that on that course, on that mission along with us uh, and they support it. And they saw the Post as an institution that was holding government to account that historically had done that and was doing that again uh, during the Trump uh, Trump era. Okay, we, we have a new advertiser here at ENP who has developed through AI an amazing tool that you can go to any online article and it will dissect it and change the lead, change the headline, so it gets better optimization, better clicks based on, you know, current metrics that it's analyzing. But we have, we, 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 we spotlighted an amazing newspaper operation in Connecticut, a Hearst owns, and, and just picked up some more, where the editor in chief starts the editorial meetings in the morning with the metrics. That makes sense. Let's look at what happened the day before. Let's see what got clicked, what didn't, what the audience wanted. That's not the way it was in the old days. You are you comfortable with those things in today's world, Martin? Martin, uh, I was comfortable. We did that at the Post as well. We started our morning news meeting looking at how we performed and. Yeah. Uh, we also talked about, you know, what people were, we had a schedule for publishing certain kinds of stories. We had looked very closely at the rhythms of readership when readership was highest and we, and we were published during those, those peak periods. Uh, and we scheduled stories for that. Uh, we had a number of metrics uh, to look at uh, the level of readership, of course, the level of conversions to subscriptions, which was an incredibly important metric for us, is which stories actually led people to uh, move from being readers to being actual subscribers. And so um, uh, we looked at engagement uh, uh, metrics as well. We had a ton of metrics, uh, some of which made a lot of sense and some that I don't think made a huge amount of sense. Um, but and some were quite punishing, uh, which I was not comfortable with. For example, um, the speed of our alerts, I was perfectly fine with measuring the speed of our alerts, but the way that we did it is that we ranked uh, us against our competitors, one, two, three, four, five. So if we were one second behind our competitor, um, we would be number two, um, not number one. Um, and it was you're only talking about one second difference between us and and the and the leading and and the leading competitor. So that's a very punishing metric and um and I think can lead to a lot of um, uh, problems. so so there are many metrics that I was fine with. and in fact, we right. did review metric. We did review metrics with department heads and sometimes with reporters. Uh, they we did make them available. They were on screens throughout our newsroom so that people could see them. Uh, and we wanted people to develop an under uh, an appreciation for, um, you know, what was required to make our business sustainable and also to understand whether their stories resonated with readers or didn't. Because if our stories aren't resonating with readers, then what's the point of writing them? We're in a struggle now to maintain journalism on a local level. You know that the disruption has been massive. The we're losing. I'm sure you know about the. We, we had Penny Abernathy just on the show last week, who was talking about uh, the latest, greatest, you know, news desert report out of Medill. Um, any advice 
you could offer those those local publishers now that are striving to maintain their mission, that Madisonian mission of being that final check on power, that spotlight that shines in the corners and still maintaining a sustainable business model. I mean, you get asked that question sometimes. Yeah, I get asked it all the time. I wish I had a ready answer. I could uh, make a mint uh, selling the answer to all of that. Um, it's a tough one. I recognize the challenges and I, 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 I want to be careful not to uh, suggest that I have the answers or offer something that's entirely glib. So, because I, I know that people are working really hard at it and it is the greatest challenge we have in journalism in this country and also in other countries that are facing the same things. Uh, I look, I mean, I think every, every institution has to really evaluate how can they engage most effectively with their community? Uh, what, you know, um, People have to work on a strategy. I mean, at the Post, we re we changed our strategy once Bezos acquired us, and it was really to move um, away from an emphasis on local journalism and more toward being reaching a national and international audience. But obviously, uh, that's not an option for most news organizations in the country. And so I think one has to focus uh, very um, determinedly on what, what do our readers want from us, what is engaging them, how do they want us to engage with them uh, and stop doing a lot of the other things, the things that really don't have any resonance with the public and focus on those things that do um, and make yourself very much a, a part of that community. Uh, I mean, people do trust their local news organizations a lot more than they trust the national news organizations. True. And that is because they are members of the community. And so that is an asset that I would uh, I would accentuate is, you know, make sure people know your reporters, make sure your reporters are out in the community, make sure uh, that you have events uh, where people can see your reporters. They recognize that they are good human beings who care a lot about their communities. Uh, they are the ones who will provide coverage of your uh, of your events. Uh, all of that uh, make the editors, uh, you know, routinely available to people. Um, you know, uh, have events uh, that actually celebrate uh, the community and highlight its great assets. Uh, all of that, you know, let the let the news organization participate in strengthening the bonds, the community bonds. And so, those are things that I, um, you know, I think are really important. I see that I live in Western Massachusetts, and. You know, I see that with our local paper, which I support, um, the Berkshire Eagle, um, right. and uh, and and there are other some other local news outlets here as well. Fortunately, um, and uh, they do a good job of uh, covering the community, uh, of having events. Um, their reporters are out in the community. Um, people support uh, the organization, even through they have a fund, a nonprofit fund that can can provide additional resources to those news organizations and. And I contribute to that, and um, and uh, you know I think they're doing a they're doing a, a really nice job. Uh, so, I mean, whatever you can do to strengthen your bonds with the community is what you ought to be focusing on, and then decide that there's some things that you can't continue to do, so that you can devote more resources to those things that actually resonate um, more effectively with the community as a whole. The book is called Collision of Power, Trump, Bezos, and the Washington Post. The author is Marty Barron. Um, we will have a link on the landing page that goes directly to getting that book, whether you want it in the good old fashioned cut a tree down print version or do it the way I did it, put it on my phone and just start reading it. Either way, um, it's a great read. And it's something I think everybody in our industry should take a take a hard look at because you are really discussing not only the the, the great news stories that you you did in in your career there you're discussing the industry as a whole and giving almost uh, sage wisdom I, I'm, I i know i'm stroking you a lot but i have to it's a great book so um marty thanks for your time can you please thanks, stay in touch with us let us know what you're up to next i'm sure your journey hasn't stopped in our industry right are you gonna do something or are you just going to sit on the sidelines on the porch and and play what horseshoes or something what's your plan well horseshoes doesn't sound very appealing but uh sitting on the porch might be nice uh in any event uh i don't know exactly what i'm going to do next i'm going to spend the you know the next uh, months uh basically through the summer uh, talking about the book and getting around the country which i'm doing a lot of right. uh totally booked um and um and then I might do that overseas. Uh, the books are going to be translated into Spanish. Um, and I might uh, go to Spain to promote it. We'll see. Um, after that, I don't really know. Uh, I'll try to figure it out for the first time in my life. I don't know what I'm going to do next. And I think I'm okay with that for now. 
Thanks so much for your time, sir. Well, thank you for your interest.